My name is Russ Malkin, and I'm the producer and director of the documentary of the tour. She wants to play a gig in every country of the world. So from the point of view of capturing it, that's why we're working with Sony. Hi everyone and welcome to this live webinar from Pinewood Studios. Uh, we've got a fantastic hour coming up. Uh, we've got some guests here who I'm going to introduce in a second. But first of all, I just want to say uh, that uh, you have a chance to contribute in real time to what we're doing. So uh, we're going to be having some polls, uh, online polls that you just have to respond to. Uh, and again, in, in almost real time, we'll be able to uh, get back to you with your response. And don't forget there's a hashtag, which is hashtag on the move, all one word, on the move, all one word. So I'm Dave Shapton from uh, redsharknews.com. We're one of the leading uh, daily updated websites for the uh, film and TV industry. That's nothing to do with celebrities. It's everything that goes on behind the camera. So our center of gravity is anything to do with moving images. Um, so I'm actually going to just talk about the content of the webinar because we're looking at something really interesting uh, and really a distinction that's cropped up over the last few years. And, and that is the difference between uh, making a shot, which is, is what we mean by uh, uh, essentially a cinematic setup. Let's imagine that everybody around you is there for the sole purpose of making this a brilliant shot. You can very much imagine what it would be like uh, making a, a feature film. You've got everybody there, everybody has their role. And most importantly, if you get it wrong, um, you can do it again. And nobody's gonna mind because that's what they're there for. Now, the second scenario is probably more uh, representative of real life, which is where you don't get a chance to do it again. It's where um, uh, you might be filming a volcano erupting, um, the Prime Minister coming out of 10 Downing Street, or a sporting event, or, or just something that's one-off, and something where you're just a bystander and where you don't get the chance to uh, take the shot again. So, um, so our guests, which I'll introduce in a second, have enormous expertise in these fields, and you'll, you'll see why when we, uh, uh, when we introduce them. Uh, but uh, let's say hello to... Russ Malkin and Ollie Lambert. Um, we'll come back to you uh, in, in just a second. Uh, first of all, I'm going to introduce the first uh, poll question, which is, uh, so this is for everybody watching, what kind of film do you normally shoot? So just let us have your response when it comes up on the screen, and we'll be able to get back to you uh, really soon with the result of that. So let's go, let's go first of all to... Uh, Russ Malkin. Uh, Ollie, feel free to chip in if, if you feel you can con well. contribute. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure you will. Uh, Russ, first of all, tell us a bit about your, your background. Um, how did you get started? I gather there's a bit of a motorbike theme here throughout your career. Well, yeah, I've, I've always been interested in motorbikes. And, um, but I think, you know, which, which subsequently sort of comes into play with a lot of the shows that we actually make. But I think for me, the, sort of the trigger that allowed me to move into what I'm doing, if you think all the way back, is I was always just fascinated by atlases and maps of the world. So I can remember my dad had this Reader's Digest big atlas, and I'd be fascinated by all these countries and what, where they were, what people did there. And, and also we had a, a small sort of cine camera, and I would be making little movies on this thing at, a, you know, 14, 14, 15 years old. So, you know, you could see that the, the thing was there. And I've managed just to merge both of those things together. So for me, too, it's perfect. You know, I love traveling. I like making shows of, of, of all the places that we go to and the people that we meet. Um, so that's really where it all started. Fantastic. Well, I tell you what, let's have a look at an example of that. We're going to show you uh, a clip from stuff that you've made, and it's going to be uh, followed immediately by something by Ollie. So let's have a quick look at this, this quick VT, and then we'll come back to you. Okay. Okay. 
Big Earth is my company and it's about enjoying the world, doing some good at the same time and just getting out there and having an adventure. It's there really as a facility to allow amazing things to happen. Each of our shows is an entirely new challenge. Devised, it's a complete change of plan. Anyone developed and delivered in-house. Fantastic, isn't it? Sounds an achievement. Yes! My name's Ollie Lambert and I'm a documentary filmmaker and about half of what I do is sort of doing self-shot documentaries in areas of conflict. I've made films in Afghanistan, Iraq, Gaza and most recently a, a quite a long trip to Syria. Okay, so we've had our first poll result in, which is great. Um, the question was, what kind of film do you normally shoot? Interestingly, 57% shoot both. Um, I'm not sure if that's just people not being non-committal <laughs> or whether that's a very interesting trend. Maybe we'll be able to drill down that, on that a bit, a bit later. But uh, anyway, I want to come back to you, uh, Ross, and just, just talk about uh, your, your company, uh, which is... Uh, it's called Big Earth, and it's more than a production company, isn't it? It's an ideas company, really. <clears throat> well, I think, for me, there was always this set, set, you know, sense of an expedition, which we want to do anyway. This is where we want to go with whom and why. And then we want to be able to capture it for TV and obviously online now, and we want to be able to do maybe a book of it or a DVD, etc. And I think traditionally, people that were doing an expedition would have a production company that would attach themselves to it. But to me, you get a friction there. Who's controlling what? But to me, I like the overarching both things. So if I want to be able to make sure we can film this, I can make sure that our cameraman can film that. So to me, Big Earth was about conceiving great ideas, finding ways of getting it off the ground, planning the route, you know, deciding on where we're going to go and how we're going to do it, how we're going to shoot it, and get all those partners on board before we go, if we're going to have sponsorship, etc. And, and that's basically what we, we do. We sort of roll it all into one big ball. And one example of this idea was the, the piece you did uh, with Ewan McGregor and Charlie Borman, continuing the motorbike theme. Mm. Um, how did that come about? Well, again, the motorbikes, I've been riding bikes since I was you know, 14, and I'd managed to persuade a, a, a TV company to commission a series on every motorcycle manufacturer in the world. So I was like in heaven. You know, I went off to India for Royal Enfield, and America for Harley Davidson, Italy for Ducati, etc. And I'd just come back, and I went to a party, and this sort of shows you, I think from a not network, it wasn't networking, but the idea that you're just out there amongst people you know, talking to people about you, what you love and what you're passionate about. And I bumped into Charlie Borman, who's a, a fellow biker, and we were arguing about what's the best bike, etc. And he said, look, I'm looking for, you know, a guy to help us make this trip around the world happen. And I met Ewan, and we just had a cup of tea and some toast and seemed to get on quite well. By then, I developed that model that I was describing to you, which is pretty unusual. There's not many people that, that do that multifaceted look at a particular idea. But here was a great opportunity and to it, put that and, into practice. And it fitted. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, and it wasn't easy, but then it worked, and we did it our way. And I think that was the interesting thing on that. It, we did it the way we wanted it, rather than the way that broadcasters were telling us to do it. And, it, and we were just lucky that it all worked out in the end. Okay, so <clears throat> I want to talk about what you're working on now, which is you're working with Joss Stone on a, a quite extraordinary tour that she's doing where she's uh, essentially performing in 200 countries. Uh, I don't think I knew that there were 200 countries. I think that includes some fairly obscure ones, the tiny ones that are about like one kilometre square, but that makes it even more of an, an achievement in my view. Um, how did you get involved with, with, with that? We just wanted to do a proper world tour. <clears throat> I mean, you know, rock bands, pop bands, whatever, they do a world tour, which is basically all over America, Japan, and, you know, Germany and England. But no one's ever gone to every country in the world. And fair credit to Josh, she said she wanted to be the first person that's done a world tour, a total world tour. Um, and I think she just heard about me being able to put together, 
you know, you know, sponsors and broadcasters and, you know, the equipment and the logistics as to how to do that and integrate it together. And again, I think we got on well together. She's a great person and she's great in front of the camera. She's fun to work with and she's got that sort of inquisitive attitude to want to travel the world and do some good at the same time. So that's, you know, that's, we, we again, it probably over a cup of tea that we got on well and, and thought, how can we make this happen? So there were really, she had two main objectives. Uh, you know, one was her personal ambition to visit so many countries and I guess bring some awareness of the diversity you find in the world. Mm. And I, I, I guess by performing, that, that's a kind of yardstick to measure the culture against, isn't it? Yeah, I think, you know, like a lot of people in business and with what she'd done before, people fly into a country for a meeting or a concert, they do what they're there for, they go back to the airport and they fly home. So she hadn't actually necessarily seen a lot of the countries that she'd been to before. And I think that sort of sense of adventure is in, is in all of us. So again, today I'd be saying, listen, if you've got an idea to go, go, do this thing, film it in the way that we're going to discuss and you'll never regret it. You know, and I think it is that sense of adventure and discovery that she wanted. But also there was the fascination of learning about music and the cultures that you bump into. You know, when you've sort of seen what lives are like in Indonesia, Philippines, you're much more appreciative of what we have here or, or actually maybe they're doing things that we should be doing here. Do you see what I mean? So there is that sort of sense of education that comes from these things too. Yeah, Ollie, we're going to come to you uh, in a big way soon. But I just wonder what you, you thought about. Well, how would you feel if you were shooting in this kind of environment, visiting so many countries? Um, uh, Pat light, I think, Yes. the most yeah. important thing. Uh, I can't stand the travelling side of it. So... Um, I mean, it's great what, what Russ does, but I would, the, the problem with filming it isn't so much the travel, it's just the amount of gubbins that you've got to take mm, with you. So, the sheer overhead. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, I would sort of find that rather daunting. So that's why we spend so long working out exactly, you know, what we take and what we don't and leaving stuff out is often the, the biggest decision rather than what you, what you actually take with you. And how long is this tour? You're, you're kind of in the middle of it at the moment. Well, I mean, the, it, it's actually over three years for it to get to, to, to every country, because also there are some countries where you, you know, might have some issues getting mm. in, mm. so you might have to do a bit covert work, get Ollie involved, you know, mm. under the barbed wire. But, I mean, you know, a lot of the trips that we do are sort of two to three months long, but they don't always have to be, you know what I mean, depending on if somebody's got an idea out there and it can be achieved in two weeks. Yeah. But you could still make a great TV se series and great content online. So you don't have to uh, pre Presumably very long. some of these, these um, gigs were in more conventional places like you know, Brussels, Paris. Yes. I mean, obviously, if you were looking at the gig itself, you wouldn't want to sort of see 200 versions of the same no. gig. So, no, no. again, what Joss was very keen to do was to get out, see the country, meet some other musicians from that country to get an idea of what, where their sort of sentiments lie. But also, you know, we've always, my particular motto has always been enjoy the, you know, enjoy the planet, but do some good at the same time. So we do a lot of work with UNICEF, for instance. But on that trip, we were doing everything from filming indigenous people in Australia to the effects of sort of HIV and AIDS related things in Lesotho, etc. And again, I think that, again, a message from this, if people are interested in travel, is if you do go and do something, do something good, even if it's small at the same time. Maybe that is sharing a message which is enough to, to, to highlight some of the issues that people have globally, you know? But yes. I think that is a, a good thing to attach to your project. Okay, well, let's have a look at uh, the practicalities here. I mean, when you're shooting for this kind of you know, doc documentary, what preparations do you, do you, do you need to make uh, you know, before you set out? What, what do you do in terms of your equipment? Well, from a, an equipment point of view, you know, for me, as a sort of, you know, producer, director, because I do wear both hats, to me it's like, you know, I know what we want to make at the end of the day, and it's a great show that people would like to watch, but, you know, it's also our creative interpretation of what we've done. So we'll use every bit of kit on the market that we think can help us do that. So from something that is going to give us beautiful imagery, it might take longer to set up, but we'll take that. Something that's fast and furious and allows us to film on the go as things actually happen, we'll take that. The action cameras that we can bolt onto bikes or boats or climbing up mountains, yeah. we'll take that. Yeah. So we'll take everything, but the smaller the better. Yeah, I think... I think Why don't you look at me then? <laughs> <laughs> well, you were giving off that image, Ollie. I, you know what I mean? I think it's because you... You work in dan dangerous zones as opposed to musical zones, so presumably... About taking less yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I do a lot of... I do sort of half and half 
um, areas of conflict, documentaries, yes. and then half, half areas of conflict, and then often, and then try and break that up with um, domestic stuff as a freelancer for BBC and Channel Four. But I do enjoy I enjoy the wrong word, but I do find you know documentaries in difficult environments quite challenging and also quite rewarding. Actually, mainly afterwards they're rewarding, but not at the time. So, I mean, talking about difficult environments, clearly, you know, one is dangerous, the other isn't. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's always the risk that you're not going to get the shot if you haven't planned it, you haven't got the equipment right. Can we go back to the idea of um, when you're planning a production like this, where does the, the story, there must be some kind of storyline to it, there must be some kind of you know, skeleton you can hang these shots on, some kind well, of framework. From my point of view, I think there's two things. There's one is having the kit that's available to actually either roll continually, like yeah. an action cam, or something that can turn on and record fast. So something that starts goes, oh, in the old days mm. where it's engaging the tape, etc. That was a frustrating five seconds for me. But is there also the, the um, energy within the camp? If your camera operators, if you let them know, please shoot everything. So you do, you do this with these little action cameras? Well, whatever they're or, filming on. Yeah, yeah. It's just like, you keep filming until I tell okay. you to stop. Yes. Unless there's a life-threatening situation yeah, yeah. where they have to be running away. Yeah. But even then, it's like, well, keep the camera going. You know, because at least, you know, and I've had that happen before. We kept the, you know, we were on a boat in Vietnam. It got swamped by a wave and not everybody on the boat could swim. And we were far enough away from rocky shores for this to be not very nice if the boat went down and it was going down. And it was like, God, well, look, just keep filming whatever happens, because there's a record, isn't there? Fortunately, we got towed out, but we did have the story subsequently when we got back. It wasn't irresponsible. It was mm. just a philosophy of like, just keep filming whatever happens. Yeah, is that is that your instinct too, Ollie? Uh, even when you're in extreme danger, to keep the, the camera rolling. Yeah, I mean, I've been in situations where I haven't had the guts to turn the camera off because I knew I'd probably forget to turn it back <laughs> on again. So I you, you just want to keep looking ahead and not. Be well, I, it's, there's so much to think about. So I did do that on um, yeah, the, a film I did recently in Syria. Something happened, and I, I just kept running, and I ended up with a, a 70 minute clip. Um, because I knew that, well, mainly you never know what's going to happen next. And uh, there's, there's, I just switched everything to automatic and just kept it running, you know, because it doesn't matter really, well, it doesn't matter what it looks like, but it's far more important the camera's actually turning over and might be able to think for itself a little bit when something else happens. You know. I think one, just to jump in on that, we've just spoken about sort of things that we thought were dangerous. But that hardly ever happens in, you know, we don't look for sort of conflict things, that's not our thing. But, you know, the humour and the relaxed, yes. relaxed nature of the person, that's why you sort of should keep rolling, because you never know it's, when it's something no funny small. is going to happen. Yeah, yeah, and also, if you just keep turning the cameras on and say, well, what are you doing now? You're not going to get anything spontaneous by definition. So you sort of want mm. to watch real life roll in front of you, and for that, you've got to keep going. Mm. You know, you've got no choice. And you can't have a situation where, where the filming is the special moment. I mean, I've often got to, gone to meet people and specifically have been holding a camera when I first met them. So it's not an unusual thing. And if they get used to the idea of that the camera's always there or might be, it, 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 it's there, it might be filming, might not. Because that moment of going like that is an immediate moment. It sort of sends cool. out the message of we are now camera. on, yeah. And I guess this is not a technique you could have used in the days of 16 millimeter film. I think it is. I mean, I think that we look back at those days. When I started out as a, as a runner, we were shooting on 16 mil for observational documentary. And it's almost impossible to imagine that you might be able to turn up to a document, an observational documentary shoot with a, a camera operator, a camera assistant, like clap a loader, a sound recorder to the director, and maybe a production assistant. And you, you think that would be incredibly invasive. In fact, people do get used to this stuff very, very quickly. I think the same principle applies. You can just probably get to that point a lot faster now. So can we just come on to uh, what kind of uh, equipment we're, we're using? I know both of you have used var variations on the... Uh, PMW, PXW, X200, uh, you know, which is, is this type of camera where it's all in one with a fixed in place zoom lens. Um, uh, it, is that, is that, is that the, the sort of mainstay of, of what, what you use these days, that type of camera? Well, it, I think it really varies. I mean, what, there's, so many, there's so many cameras out there. I mean, people are always asking what's the best camera to use for this, for a documentary, and there, there is no, there is no perfect camera really. We have now. I sort of like to think about it like a sort of a, a needle on a, on a dial, mm. where you have 
you've got ease of use on one side and amazing picture quality on the other. And you might have an iPhone, say, on one side, and you might have like, the Alexa on the other. Yep. You know, the iPhone's incredibly easy to use, but the picture quality, you know, you've got no, you can't operate the lens, you've got no control of the sound. The other end of the spectrum is incredibly complicated to use, but produces extraordinary visuals. And I'm just trying to find for each project or each, even just sh each shoot, some kind of sweet spot where I can balance um, the maximum level of picture quality with, uh, with allowing as, as much brain space as possible for me as a director and storyteller to get that right. So the, PM, the 200, X200 or PMW200, which I'd used a lot, is great for being able to get out of the bag and it's turning over really fast. It's relatively robust. Um, it's a fantastic you know, run and gun camera for that. Mm. Um, but it meant that when you had more time and a, you, know, you could sit down, maybe do an interview, maybe a master interview, it, you know, it didn't quite have the kind of visual richness that you can get out of uh, yes. some of the DSLRs, Prime yes. Lens stuff, or the F7. Yes. F7. So I think the FS7, which I've sort of upgraded to now, is, is a good next step. And so that's my camera, and that will be a very simple, it, I can get out and be turning over within about 30 seconds, um, and it can be turning over relatively quickly, um, but also affords me some kind of um, a much more rich visual layer if I've got a bit more time to Well, I'll tell up. you what, we'll come back to the FS7 uh, in a little while, because it's a fascinating development in, in cameras. Um, I wanted to ask both of you what you do about using several types of camera. How do you how do you integrate those different types of shot and different types of look into the final um, piece? I mean, presumably you you know you grade it if only mildly just to match the shots. Or but I think from our point of view, it's it's very much you know if we're on the move you know, and you haven't got time to sort of set up focus and establish tripods, then a camera like this, the 200, is, is just you're pointing, mm. you're shooting, you're able to zoom and pull back, and you just get the action, <coughs> and you can get the audio. And I said, you know, the audio is, is much more important than everybody thinks. You know, you must take, pay a lot of attention to the audio because if you're just capturing somebody swinging on a train out of Mumbai and they're chatting away and it's hot and it's steaming, mm. it's a great picture but you get back and it's all muffled or unusable, then you've wasted the whole thing. Whereas actually, if you get the audio from them, you can establish where they are and then cut away to train shots and other stuff that you'll have from your other camera. So the audio is, is, is equally, if not in, in some situations, more important than the visual. So that camera allows that to happen easily. We will take a camera like this to get the beauty shots. The and FS7. also if you're gonna, the FS7, you know, a nice shot of the bikes yes. coming to you or somebody climbing up a mountain, it's magical. You know, you, and, but we need the action cameras so that if you actually want to sort of strap something to a speedboat or, mm. you know, a, 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 on a car or something, you've, you've actually got something where, you know, that can roll consistently. And if you don't capture something, you can wipe the, the, uh, the card and, and, and use it again. Or the, the, uh, the video, um, the, the MVR, I think you call it, the midi, movie video camera or something like that. Yes. The small handheld thing which you can use for your talent on screen, if you like, to, to record yeah, what they're saying. This is what I call a diary camera. Diary camera, yeah. that's, but, but because we use that for our VO as well. So somebody that's like tired and knackered and bitten by mosquitoes or whatever they are, when they come out of the tent, like, oh, I had a terrible night's sleep last night, and that's full of emotion, and you can use that as your sort of VO on your final edit, as well as if you want to use it as a narrative thing, uh, 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 you know, transcribed if you ever wanted to write a yeah. book. Because you can remember what you felt like at the time. I think, I think Joss Stone used this camera yeah, quite a lot. Yeah, she loved it. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, and, they, and people with that will film a lot of their own stuff. And you, as the creative person in the edit, can decide whether to use it or not. But if you didn't have that, you suddenly think there's a gap. And they're so cheap now, or relatively yeah. inexpensive, yeah. Um, that why not have it? And they're fun. Talking of, you know, relatively inexpensive, I wondered if you guys had thought about using this type of camera, which is the, the Sony Alpha 7S. Uh, it's, it's, it's a DSLR shape, but it's mirrorless. This one's currently enveloped in some extraordinary exoskeleton, but um, it's got extraordinary low light capabilities. Uh, you're never quite sure what its exact, uh, you know, ASA rating is because, you know, how much noise is acceptable to you is, is arbitrary. But this mm. thing, I've used it myself, and you can almost shoot in the dark and get a perfectly good daylight touch. Yeah, when we turned up this morning, we were both all over that. I think yeah. it looks great. I have heard, I've never tried it, but I have heard very good things about it, particularly on low light. Um, and the fact that you can, you can whack on 
your own lenses to it. I don't know, it look, does, does look very Well, having, having used it myself quite a bit, I almost look forward to turning the lights out and then taking the shot. Right. It, it's that sense of <laughs> that's, that's, well, that's think, just weird. I think yeah. the other thing for that is that the, what I would call in the old terms, do you still call it a hot shoe? I don't know. But the thing at the top that you can, you can slip a microphone on that. Yes. And it's got the contact for yeah, the yeah. microphone to go straight on the top. I, exactly. I think and there's to a me, Sony, it's like brilliant. Sony kit you can slide you on can the top. You can put that, that in yeah. your bag, keep it on you, and then just, you know, so you're ready to go. Yes. That's mm, the key yes. thing. All right, so uh, just going to interject here with another poll. Uh, and the poll is, what type of camera do you use? Simple enough, you've got four options there. I won't go through them. They should be on the screen any time now. So, so let us know what kind of camera, from the choices that come up on the screen, what kind of camera you use. So I'm um, going to move uh, on to, uh, back to Ollie now and just talk a little bit about your Again, feel free to chip in because you, you guys have a lot in common. Um, so, <laughs> I, I, I think I think what you're specifically known for uh, is is working in hazardous environments. Um, and as you were saying, you, you like to quite understandably intersperse that with more regular type of, of of documentary work. But I mean, how did you get into this 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 field where where, where you you go out and do dangerous stuff? Um, well, I was, I'd sort of started out in documentaries, um, in a UK-based documentaries as a freelancer with, with Channel 4. And uh, I think it was just, just, I just got approached about the possibility of going to Iraq for the invasion in 2003. Um, and I sort of lit up at the idea, really, because, you know, I think a lot of documentary makers just love the idea of going to either uncharted territory, um, either for themselves or for that feels a little bit remote or the edge of some kind of experience. And the idea of um, this project was to be embedded with a, a military field hospital on the Iraq Kuwait border that was run by British um, uh, reservists, medical reservists. And that was, I thought that would be absolutely fascinating. Um, and uh, I fought hard to get it because I was quite green and I think it was because the, all, the, all, the, all the grandees that do this kind of stuff weren't really up for it. Um, and I, I, I sort of, by the skin of my teeth, got that as a gig uh, for Channel 4. And it was, a, it was a very simple choice at the beginning, given the constraints of the budget. Either I could take a, a DOP and maybe a sound recordist, that would, that we could afford about 10 days or maximum two weeks filming, or I could quickly learn how to shoot my own stuff um, and shoot for eight weeks. So I picked up, I think it was a DSR, 500 and um, went out and was there for yeah nearly two months um, and it was an extraordinary experience and I think because I was sort of coming from a slightly documentary perspective but parachuted into what's usually the domain of current affairs um, there's there's not there's not many people who enjoy doing that I think is the, is the truth of it um, it's a very unpleasant experience at the time but that film that's called Battle Hospital did did well really and um, got into festivals and stuff and um, from there, I sort of have been continually approached to do, sort of, you know, bring a documentary sensibility to what's traditionally current affairs material. And that's fine by me, because current affairs tends to have the best stories, really, that, that have the most relevance. I'm just going to stop you for a second, because we've had the second poll result. It really is like election night here. And uh, let's see if I can interpret it's this. Far more exciting. So, um, all right, we've got another evenly split result here. The question was, what type of camera do you use? 35.4% um, uh, use a DSLR or mirrorless camera like the Sony Alpha 7S. 24.9% uh, use a traditional fixed le lens camera like the PXW uh, X200. 15.4%, um, that's interesting, use a large format sensor camera. Uh, that would be like the FS7. And 24% use uh, more than one of those. So slightly non-committal, but actually uh, the biggest chunk, that's 35%, use, the, uh, use DSLRs or mirrorless cameras like the Sony Alpha 7S. And the smallest uh, proportion, which is 15.4%, use large format uh, uh, cameras with, with interchangeable lenses. Uh, so uh, uh, if you add the 15.4% the to the 
uh, that gives us very nearly 50% of all people using large format sensors, which is pretty significant, I think, I really. Think, I think that is significant. I mean, I, I think, you know, you've got to remember there's people that will use the camera. So, I mean, I know how to film, and, mm. but I very, you know, don't normally, you know, use a camera myself. I'll have camera people yes. that come on the trip. So from my point of view, I'm looking at a broad range of cameras, whereas actually if you were a camera person, you might have a leaning towards one type of camera because that's the sort of thing that you like to do. So when I'm talking, you know, I'm not picking one over the other because I just see them having a specific reason to, to use them at that specific point. Do you so see what you, I mean? And, and, I, and I like that. We love kit, yeah. you know, and I love experimenting with kit, you know. So from my point of view, it's like I'd like to use them all you know, to yeah, yeah. help us but, tell our story. what you definitely don't do is you don't plan your production around the kind of camera that is available to you. No, but if somebody, well, you know, if somebody's like, you know, you've got the uh, action camera that's got yes. the little viewfinder on the, the wrist. Yeah. So from us, oh, that's a laugh. Yeah. You can go along on your bike like that, whereas maybe before we would have mounted yeah, it yeah. on the handlebars you'd, you'd or something. You'd be tempted to use it. So I think there's, in like the drones, we, we'll always have a, a bit of a laugh with the new mm. piece of kit. And then mm. we just see, well, actually, that really helps us because we can actually do more. So like the video diaries, when we, like we've said before, like when I was crossing into Iran once, I was actually filming on my phone because it meant I could get the picture of us. While you were pretending to be on the phone. While I was pretending to be on the phone, we were filming the arguments we were having with the border crossings, et cetera, et cetera. And you couldn't have pulled that out. They would have confiscated no. it. No, no. So I just think, you know, whatever kit is out there, we can find a, maybe a way that we can actually have fun and integrate it into what we want, the story we want to tell. Because at the end of the day, the final product is really what it's about. It's a sort of dangerous way of getting a bit obsessed with, with equipment. And it's, it's like, almost like a comfort zone that it's much easier to think about the technology that we're using or the lenses or the camera or the sensor. And really, it's, uh, I find, particularly with sort of documentary students, is that they're, it's much more comfortable, much easier to talk about you know, pixels than it is to talk about what the film's actually about, because that's a much harder question to answer. You know, after the first, I remember seeing an amazing film called Helen Back Again uh, that was nominated for an Oscar, and it's one of the first sort of feature docs that was shot on 5D. And after that, it was so visual that everyone got obsessed with 5Ds, and everyone wanted to talk about their rig. And when if you met sort of young filmmakers, it was always about what rig they had. And I, and I was far more interested in what their film was going to be about or what the story was or why they wanted to tell it. And it's often a way when things are difficult with, you, with a film, people obsess about the technology. And actually, of course, if, if it's of a good story, you can shoot it on toilet paper. There's one area, though, where technology is always important, and, and that's when you're capturing audio. Mm. Uh, you have to use the right tools for the job. I'm just wondering how... Uh, the, the, your approach differs. I mean, obviously, there's a large, with your latest tour, there's a large musical element. Presumably, you can just plug into the, the live desk and get a feed from that. But how do you deal with, uh, you know, so many different people taking part, so many spontaneous type shots? It's as important to grab the audio as, as the visuals, obviously. I mean, a lot of time, you know, I'll see people just putting a top mic on one of these cameras. They may not have time to put time mics on everybody. Mm. And, you know, at the end of the day, those microphones, depending on which one you use, is there to pick everything up. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if it's rumbling and there's noise in the background it's, and it can become unusable, um, then, you know, you just, you can't go back to some of these places either. Mm -hmm. You know, so when you said about make and take, yeah, you want to make something beautiful, but you've got to take the opportunity when it's there. So I'd always recommend that people have two audio sources. So just have another microphone underneath yes. as the camera person. Yeah. So you've got the top mic covering whoever you want to get a bit of sound off, but this one's right underneath the shot to make sure you're guaranteed you've got good sound off your main person. If you, if you don't do that, you're taking a big risk, I think, because it's not difficult to do. I'm just quite pragmatic about shooting, by the way. You know, to me, it's not, you know, loads of numbers. It's like you want a great picture and great sound when you come home, you know, because that's when you look at it all. You know, if you have got the opportunity, by the way, to ask somebody to do it again for safety, then always do it. Yeah, yeah. You know, because it's when you're back in London and you're in your edit, you think, oh my God, it didn't work. I can't I mean, go back there and do it again. You can't go back. No, so no. I always have two audio sources. Keep it straightforward. And if in doubt, do it twice. Yeah. If you yeah. can. Ollie, um, what's your approach to audio? You know, when you might even be under fire or running away from something. Yeah, always under fire. It's, not, it's yeah. quite rare to be under fire. I mean, I, yeah. usually, I mean, if we're, as I said before, you know, I do sort of half and half. It's not like I'm constantly out in yeah. areas of conflict. But usually for those kind of trips, I want to be 
I mean, the smallest team possible. I mean, I tend to, I'll shoot, I'll direct, um, I'll, I'll do very simple sound, you know, with just one radio mic, one top mic. Um, I don't want to take, a, ca I don't wanna take a, a camera operator, I don't want to take a sort of sound recorder, mainly because it's, it's expensive, it's dangerous, the more people is there... This, is, what we can see on the screen now, is that the sort of rig you'd use typically? I think it's the... W yeah, something like that. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'd mount a, um, I'll, I'll mount a one radio mic receiver on the camera. That's always good to drop on a main contributor, or if it's a group of people, I'll drop the radio mic on the, mo the person who's at the centre, who's always the quietest. Sometimes I dangle, dangle it down from the roof and just have it in the middle of the room and can shoot around it. And then I'll have a top mic as well. So a, a very kind of simple setup. And I will very often, if, I, if I'm only on a top mic, then I'll just split that, that one audio input onto tracks one and two and have one on manual, one on automatic. Often, you know, in, in, in situations where it's very kind of kinetic, I'll have all the audio set mm. to automatic. Because uh, generally, even if, you know, there might be times when it, it starts to, you know, that horrible situation where things mm. go quiet and then you can hear the camera ramping up yes. the, and then we'll cut down again. You know, that's something I can live with that's far better to have that than having the level set too, too low or too high and you can't use any of it. So okay. I try and keep it as simple as possible, really. Let's just go back to uh, you know, this fascinating area of how you work in a hostile environment. How do you, how do you plan for that in terms of equipment? I mean, I, I sort of plan and plan and plan, basically. Mm. I mean, there's no, um, there's, no, there's no, you can't prepare too much for that. I mean, my sort of general rules are, I want to be able to carry everything on my own in one lift, because I can't afford to be going backwards and forwards to collect things. So I have to have, uh, and I also have to have two of absolutely everything. I work on the assumption that everything could break and there will be no opportunity to get it fixed. So that would be two cam everything from two cameras, two charging cables, two USB cables, three or four drives, mm. um, because there's no chance of ever getting that backed up. And then all of that stuff has to be able to be carried only by me. Yes. So, and there's also flak jackets, and there'll be medical equipment. Because if you're running for your life, you can't go back and get the it's second not, flight case. Well, well, yeah. I mean, yeah. It's, it's not. I mean, I luckily haven't had uh, many experiences like that. But yeah. just. But you have prepare, to plan for it. Plan for that yeah. eventuality. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, and then, but the big, the, and then packing it repeatedly to see if that is going to work or not. And then I've usually got room for two pairs of socks and, <laughs> and a toothbrush. But, um, yeah. So, uh, Ross, what's your what's your approach to uh, of packing stuff, and I know I know you these days you're not the cameraman, but but what's your approach to uh, taking the stuff you need? Presumably, again, two of everything, or, or an well, I mean, amount of backup. You, I mean, yeah, I mean, I don't physically, but I mean, I, I can recall all the times the, the couple of days before we're going that mad thing where they've got the backpacks open and there's all the little pockets with everything that we've decided to take, and everyone, well, I can't get that in, yeah. you know, and it's like, well, we've got to because we're like you. We want to carry everything, and you don't want to have to go. You can't go back. You can't have no. two lifts to use that phrase. No. So even like the tripods, like okay, we'll take one heavy tripod, one lightweight one, and go, you know what I mean. So we do think about every piece of kit and a bit of backup and how it's going to be packed and how quickly you can get it out, because there's no point in having it all in the backpack and you're going to take five minutes to put. You know what I mean. So there has to be that sort of quick for me anyway. There has to be a little bit of a quickness of the ability to turn turn round and get back into action again. Mm -hmm. um, but that's why we pick camera and people that have, feel like that. You know, you know, you can work with. Well, I don't work like that. I was like, okay, well, you're not for us then. You know, and again, I think if anyone's watching this, that sort of sense of your own identity is how you know. Because a lot of people will shoot and edit now. They're aware of different types of camera. You know, do you see what it means? Do you want that sort of person that? has a can-do attitude towards embracing what you're trying to do. Because it's not really about the kit. The kit is there to help you do what you want to yeah, do. Totally. Do you see what I mean? Mm, mm. You know, the end result is what it's about and being able to have some fun while you're doing it. Yeah, yeah. And I've just, you know, one small thing, when you're interviewing somebody and they're standing there like ages, while the people are sorting out the radio mics and sorting out what lens in the back, they're like, you know, that you can see the energy just gradually going out of them. So when you talk to them, they might have had a great story to tell, but by the time you're actually ready to roll, mm. it's sort of gone. Yeah, I had a, when, know, I was, so. when I was starting out, I did this sort of training thing for a, for a new director strand on, well, on Carlton, and we all had an exercise where you had to take it in turns to be the camera operator, mm. then the sound recordist, then the interviewer, then the interviewee, 
than the director. But when it, the most interesting part of that for me was when I, it was my turn to be the interviewee, because they're just about to start, and then there's something wrong with the lights. And for about three or four minutes only, a very short amount of time, there, everyone was fiddling around and trying to fix something, and no one spoke to me, and I increasingly felt like this lump of meat that was just sat there. And so when it came to actually talk, I felt incredibly self-conscious and not very, uh, not really up for having a chat. And I think that is a really important thing. To, it was a great lesson for me, actually, that, that when you're the importance of not getting subsumed into your gadgetry, because that's usually if you're filming a person going through a process or any kind of journey, whether it's physically or mentally, you've got to be engaged with that and not endlessly buried in the dials. You know. No, no, I understand. Um, I just wanted to ask you, uh, because the FS7 is a really important new type of camera, um, and you, you've used that. Mm. You started to use that, yeah. haven't you? Um, and I, I just wanted to, to mention here in this section that uh, I've, I've noticed that there is now this move towards two distinct styles of filming. There's mm. the cinematic, so-called and much overused term of cinematic, which uh, embraces everything from uh, shallow depth of field to you know, heavily graded footage to give you a particular look. And uh, there's, there's the, uh, uh, the, the, the more sort of verite type of, of footage, which is pretty much as it comes, and necessarily so you know, you know, if, if, if you're um, you know, in a documentary. Uh, but uh, we, we now have an amazing choice of cameras. So, so you, you have in your, your repertoire now this this um, you know, arguably cinematic style camera, the FS7 with a, a big sensor, interchangeable lenses, you know, you could use beautiful primes or incredible zooms. And then you have the, the more prosaic traditional type of camera, which still has, and we've seen from the figures that a lot of people still use this, mm -hmm. uh, a very powerful role in always being ready to go. Uh, and that would be your go-to camera if, if like you hear it, hear a gunshot or an explosion, and you've got to run to it and get, get the footage, I guess. But, but how, how would you, uh, you know, decide between using these two types of cameras in, in, in the kind of role that you play? Yeah, no, that's, I mean, that's, the sort of, that's, that's a big question. I actually flogged my PMW 200 and bought the FS7 very, pretty much the day it was announced, actually. So um, I think that it, the, the FS7 is, is not a very, it, it can take much better pictures. It can give you very shallow depth of field. Mm. It can give you that sort of that, that shallow look, call it cinematic or whatever. But the thing is that people often forget is that just because you've got a prime lens that can open up to like 1.8 and get very shallow depth doesn't mean you have to shoot in that way. You no, can, you can st <laughs> change to stop to f8. Exactly. And then you have got a much greater depth of field, which is much more suited to this kind and of Actually, camera. while we're talking about lenses, I just wanted to mention that we, there was going to be a third guest here today. Uh, Guy Thatcher, who unfortunately uh, isn't well, uh, so uh, it's a real shame he couldn't come. Just want to say, say uh, from all of us here, I hope you get well soon, Guy. I'm sure, sure you'll be fine uh, in a very short time. <laughs> really sorry you couldn't be here. But uh, anyway, let's, let's get back to talking about, you know, depths of field. Well, I, think, I think from my, our point of view, I think it, the, it just answers itself. Mm. You, know, you can't use a camera like that if you're halfway up a mountain and swinging by a rope where you might be able to hold that yes. in one hand and actually be operative. Yeah, yeah. Whereas actually if you're setting up a nice interview to say, well, what happened today when you're talking to somebody, you've got time to set it up and you've got time to, to do the beauty shot. So that's how we would, it just, you know, if you had one camera that did both things, we, we, would, we would use that, you know. And, um, but both of these cameras do a, a great job at what they do and you just use both when, when it suits. Just, so, just in case people wonder, this is actually an FS7 here on this uh, tripod, and uh, uh, you can see it's a fairly unusual form factor, but actually very ergonomic with this, this hand grip here, and it, it sits easily on, on your shoulder. Uh, most people, when they try it, it's like a, a kind of revelation in terms of ergonomics, because I think the, uh, the traditional kind of you know, rectangular box shape for cinematic cameras has, has been prevalent for some time, so it's quite refreshing to see uh, an example that's had some ergonomic thought behind it. Um, so, uh, so essentially, to sum up, if you're going to choose between the, the two cameras, you, you probably use the FS7 type camera for your beauty shots uh, and the sort of kind of shots where you're, you know, you have this make opportunity, mm. uh, and, and the more traditional all-in-one handheld 
uh, camera. But there is some crossover as well, there isn't is, there? I mean, I, so, I mean, this, this, is, I, this is my camera, and that's, I, I think, I mean, people wanted to sell it as a bit of a run and gun. I would say it's kind of jog and gun camera. Yeah. It's a little bit longer to set up. Um, but with a few modifications, it can be, it can be packed, um, ready, and you can have it turn. You can have it out of the out of the case and turning over in about 20, 25 seconds, which for me is good. Twenty five seconds. Yeah, I mean yeah. that's that. I've, I've bought a few modifications on that, um, and it, so it can be used for that. Um, I like the what, why I feel the FS7 is an interesting camera, and it, it is quite a, a big step up. It's quite a big different. Uh, things to get your head around from the 200. There's a lot more to take in in terms of S-Log2 and lookup tables and all that gubbins. But that can do, fulfill a combination of being able to get observational. I would, I would, I'm definitely, I'm using it now for a BBC doc that is involving observational stuff and that's, it's great for that. But it will also give me, if I have a bit more time to sit down and do formal interviews with lights, it can it can deliver that as well. I only really want to have one camera on a production. I think. Yes. I don't. I'm not. I mean, Russ and I are different in that way. I want to have a quite a, um, a very mobile, very simple pared down mm. kit that will serve a lot of functions. So that it's that's an interesting transition. So that's why. I've let's let's it. talk a little bit about lenses, and I don't want to get technical because it's an immensely technical. Oh, subject. please get technical. Uh, <laughs> please uh, don't. <laughs> and. Um, we do have the opportunity now to use a wide range of lenses. Uh, and I guess for some of us, that opportunity is, is new. So we're kind of learning our way with the different mm. types of prime and zoom it's terrifying. lenses. I mean, I've, it's, it's, this, is, this is the first time I've actually gone the primes route. And yes. it's quite a big sort of landscape to get your head around. And presumably the, the, the choice or the compromise you have to make between a prime and a zoom lens is uh, quality versus versatility. Mm. Um, I mean, I quite like the idea of, you know, of actually sometimes at the beginning of a production deciding, I'm going to shoot this primarily on, <laughs> on primes. Yes. Um, and actually, I've begun to shoot some observational stuff and just thinking, right now, I'm just going to stick to a 35 mil. Yeah. And that, it, it's a different way of thinking. It doesn't allow you to suddenly crash in if something's happening, but it's, it, uh, it does give a completely different look and feel which you can embrace. There is an argument which is the best way to zoom is with your legs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's good. Yeah, I mean, but also it, it, it just makes you, I always, you know, a lot of the best observational documentary cameramen sort of talk about having a very quick mind but slow feet. And that, that Steve yes. Standen, the cameraman, told me that. And I just love that sense of things might be crazy around you, which you can be taking in mentally. But what primes do is they slow you down physically, and I kind of like that discipline that that, that gives you, because it often gives you a kind of a feel for the material that you come out with. Is, is, is the next poll in? Uh, me and Russ are very No, we've got some questions about. coming in, which oh. is really exciting. And I think he's ordering the pizza. Yeah. Um, I, I just wanted to ask, while, while, while we're getting the results in front of us, mm. um, you know, what, what, do you th what do you think is the future for... Um, for, for, for you guys, you know, what are you looking We're for? We're all doomed. Well, that, that, that's, that's one, one view, but what, <laughs> what it, it, you know, let's say we, we move forward five years, what do you think is going to be typical, the typical type of equipment that you guys are going well, to be using? I mean, you know, at one end of the, the, you know, the scale is, as we, as we were just saying over tea earlier, you know, you can get a mobile phone now that takes broadcast quality pictures with a, an app where you can edit something that you could watch on TV. Mm. You know, you're there now. So it'd be interesting to see where people go with that. At the other end of the scale, I think there's always going to be that need for sort of complete control over, you know, the image quality mm. and to talk about all the things that we've spoken today. But, mm. you know, and, you know, the smaller cameras as well. There's, there's going to be that need to be able to sort of have small cameras to position them in places that maybe you couldn't have done before. So, you know, that's exciting, yes. isn't it? Yeah. You know what I mean? That idea that you've got a tiny little camera now that you can put in something, and you've only got to look at MotoGP and Formula One as to see how that technology is compressed down the, uh, to tiny and it's increased the enjoyment of watching it on television. So to me, it's like, you know, what's the end result that makes it either more entertaining to watch, that you get something that you couldn't do before, adds a bit of a fun factor, you see what I mean? It's the end result as to what you could do with the kit is the important thing. Not, not just, I think if you just used a piece of camera equipment and actually when you put it on the screen, it doesn't fit in with the story that you're trying to tell, then I think that's when it's sort of gone a bit wrong. 
I, th I mean, I feel slightly crippled by the choice uh, that's out there at the minute. There are so many different, you know, that, that A7 looks, looks really interesting. And the, the, the 200, when you've just, that, yes. I've given yeah. up, you know, I'd, I've sort of given up on the 200, but then you're just describing in a situation where you actually might need to operate with one hand. I thought, okay, I can't do that with that. Should I be using a GoPro, an action camera or something? When well, a GoPro I, doesn't work in that situation, funny enough. Yeah. Because we've tried it, it's not robust, it's not sort of big enough to, you know, again, it's a lot of this is sort of human, you know? It's like, you know, the ability to sort of have that with the microphones plugged in quickly and yeah. you're hanging on with one hand doing yeah. this or yeah. you're just capturing it. And also the other thing that comes from it, I think is a bit of integrity from the person watching. So actually, I'm believing you've not set that up. You filmed it as it literally happened. Yeah. Whereas actually, if everything's sort of mapped out and it's really beautiful, they know it's been post-produced you know that you're going to have to have a bit of voiceover yes. over the top that has been crafted over the top of that picture, which is great for certain programs, but if you're sort of saying, actually, I trust that person's actually showed me what really happened, yeah. then you've got to film it as it happens. And, 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 Sorry, and, I, I was going to say, I could talk about this all day, but we've got some questions in here from, from uh, the, the audience. Um, one of them, uh, inevitably, is, is what made you buy a new Sony equipment? Well... Shall I go first? Please. <laughs> when we did that trip on, we did these things, long way round, long way down, we did the race to Dakar. We, you know, although if you watch that show, you'll see there were two schools of thought, but in the end of the day, we picked the best bike for doing the job that we needed to have done. And that bike went round the world without a glitch, really, apart from the, when we made it make, make a mistake. And that's the same with camera equipment. You, best to, you buy the best camera that you can afford to do the job that you need. And that's, you know, that's why you pick Sony. God, you're so on message, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't written down. But it's true, you know, you, you, with all the stuff that you've got available, if you took, okay, you know, there are cameras for specific jobs, aren't there? Mm. There isn't one camera that does everything. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, you know, if you want to have something that does all this, it's everyone's a personal choice, but, you know, you need it to work and you need it to mm. not break. The main reason I've, st I've stuck with it is mainly that I, I, st I started out on like the Z1 and then the Z5 and the Z7. Um, oh, the Z1 was the HDV camera, yeah? No, it was, I think it was even before HDV. It was a bit like that. Yeah, basically that. I've still tape. got one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I've just, I, I've just, just the ergonomics of it hasn't really changed that much and I just kept myself going with it. I think it's one of the reasons why I couldn't, I didn't really adapt that well to the DSLRs, like the 5D and the C300. I just couldn't, I wasn't really, my brain wasn't wired enough in that way. Um, but they do feel, I do always find myself coming back to um, uh, just the ergonomics of that sort yes. of Sony line. Really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. So here's a question. Uh, uh, it's, it's to Ollie, actually. Uh, it says, you push the importance of story over gear or mm. kit. What's your single most most important piece of advice to get the best stories? My single best bit of advice is what I'm always looking for and the thing that helps me in terms of shaping a film and makes sense of what it is that I'm doing is that I try to find the smallest window with the very biggest view. So often these big subjects can feel overwhelming and very complicated, lots of different actors, events, baggage, history, possibility. And what I'm always trying to do is boil down what is this film about, what is the big subject, and what is the very, very small prism through which I could look to see all of that. That might be a single family, or a single character, or a, or a single location, but simplify it, boil it down to its absolute essence, and hopefully those, and that's exactly what, I did a film about Gaza in 2006, just after Hamas got elected. And it was such, I went there, I was there for about um, six weeks and I couldn't make sense of this enormously complex situation with divisions and Hamas and Fatah and the blockade and Israel and Palestine and it was just crazy. And I, I went, I found one kid who sold tea in the car park of the hospital. And the car park of the hospital and the hospital itself told, through the stories and the people who went there, revealed everything you needed to know about Hamas, Fatah, fighting, incursions, shortages, and it was that tiny prism. So my bit of advice is always, and I say this to, I say this to a lot of people, is, is this, it's the small window with the really big view is often the way to marshal your story uh, into a sort of meaningful uh, narrative. That's a great answer, really insightful, thank you. Uh, another question here, um, 
what do you think about DSLRs now there's such a wide choice of dedicated uh, video cameras in the same sort of price range? Do you think the DSLR revolution is over? I mean, I, I, I think. I don't know if you've ever used DSLRs. See, well, we have. I yeah. mean, I, I, I don't know. I, it's just what works for you as an individual, isn't it? I think it's, it's funny, as I said before, you know, I was working with some people recently, they were doing something. I said, Have you thought of maybe doing it this way or using that? And so, well, no, we want to use this. And everybody's got their own thoughts, haven't they, as to what they feel comfortable. You know, we've all got our own personalities. Some people are very technical, some people are very creative, some people, you know, want to be sort of, you know, not told what to use, but do you see what I mean? So it's what works for the individual at the end of the day, whether you're the director or the actual camera operator or something. I'd be interested to see if, if DSLRs in their current, in their, you know, this, are they actually looking like a, a, a single leaf, lens reflex mm. stills camera. I'd be interested to see whether they're really still around in, in five years' time because they they take amazing pictures, but the ergonomics of them is simply not. It's designed for taking stills. Mm. It's not designed for shooting video. And now that, and I think that my understanding was I couldn't understand why you couldn't take the the gub, the, the interior of a DSLR, which is so yeah. small, and put it in a camera that actually sits on your shoulder a little bit. But isn't that effectively what... The well, I think this is what's is, starting yeah. to happen yeah. now. So I, I'd be interested to see it when, when things have got... You know, the ergonomics of the FS7 are good. I mean, there's definitely, there's definitely improvements that mm. are going to happen with that. Yeah. Um, but also, the audio was always a problem with yeah. them. You know, what, you yeah. can't plug in an XLR lead, or you've got to have some mm. crazy rig on top of yes. it to allow it to do yes. it, yeah. and you can't focus it. I mean, you can watch programmes where people have used that and they're desperately trying to focus as they go. And you can see it on you the final product. Hunting, hunting, Actually, hunting. Actually, yeah. it was on the news the other day and it's like, wow, that's not acceptable, is it? You know, like, I don't know, even I was it's thinking. It's a really, really good point about the audio. I suppose the other thing is that the sensor is an optimised, dedicated video sensor. So you're not going to have all this line skipping and moiré that you tend to get with the, the DSLR type right. sensors. So... I'd be surprised if DSLRs are really going to be that favoured. I know that they're, they're very popular because... So many people have just got a training in them because mm. they were giving people, you know, there's lots of people who now know how to use them. Um, but the ergonomics of, of, of the cameras that are just now starting to come out, where you are able to get a 35mm or a full frame sensor within something that's actually built for shooting video rather than built for shooting stills, I think that is going to start drawing people over. Brilliant. Well, unbelievably, we're out of time. Thanks, guys. The time's really shot by. It's been absolutely fascinating. Thanks ever so much for taking part. Um, Thank you. And That's thanks, nice. everybody, for, for watching. Um, hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, please uh, join the conversation. Keep it going by using hashtag uh, on the move, all one word, on the move. And please do fill out the survey, which is going to appear at the end of this, this webinar. And uh, thanks again for watching. We will see you next time. Bye. <laughs>